<clears throat> Sing it. You may not say that afterwards. <sighs> well, God forgive us. It's wonderful. Yeah, well. I gotta go potty. Take time. Take, uh, take, take another minute or two. It's live right now. Oh, sorry. Sound <laughs> like a grown up. I gotta go potty. Services. This is the last one on Wednesday night. We'll Thursday night have Monday, our Monday Thursday uh, service, uh, and we are having. Uh, um, I'm forgetting her name, Schmid. Lindsay, Lindsay's first name. Lindsay Schmid will be making her first communion next Thursday night. So, and then uh, that service will be at six thirty. And then Friday night we have the service of shadow, shadows, a tenebrae service, which will also be at six thirty. And then Easter Sunday we're going to just have the nine o'clock service. If there's overflow, they can go over into the fellowship hall. Those are all the things I need to tell you about. Let's all stand for our call to worship. And thanks to Diane for being here tonight and Mark and Minuet as well. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love your Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Heavenly Father, please touch our hearts, soften our hearts, and make our hearts penitent before you. Holy Father, have mercy. Oh God, we are deeply sorry for having offended you, and we regret all our sins. Forgive us, Lord, see in us your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, so that you may see in us see us as white as snow. Let us forgive others and treat them with the mercy that you show to us. Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. May we worship you always, for it is from dust we come, and to dust we shall return. Every breath is from you, Lord. You alone are God, and you alone are most holy. Return us to you, O God. Wrap your arms around us, and embrace us, and guide us. Amen. Confess those sins and receive the forgiveness that we have in the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Holy God, who is rich in mercy and loved us even when we were dead in sin, has saved us by the blood of the Holy Lamb, Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I now offer to you this absolution. The Almighty and Merciful Lord grants you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord?
Tonight's gospel reading is from Mark's gospel, the third chapter, verses 22 through 27. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. The gospel of the Lord is to you, O Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you may be seated. We finish our series this evening on seven things the Lord hates. I covered on the second week both the lying tongue and a false witness, so we've moved to the seventh and last thing that the Lord hates, the one who spreads discord among brothers. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but there's been some chur crazy church splits that have occurred, and I have a list of them here from Tom Rainier from Church Answers. He had 25. I'm going to read you a few. But he asked pastors to send in to him, you know, what big disputes churches had had and splits that occurred as a result of them. And so there was uh, one church that had a big fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. Dying to know how that turned out, aren't we? But anyhow. Now look at this one. They had a big fight over what picture of Jesus to put in the foyer picture of Jesus in the foyer. A dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper, get this, had crayon grape juice instead of grape juice. We all know in Adverbs 4.11 it says grape juice, right? It doesn't say crayon grape juice. That's worth a split over, isn't it? And two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee. In one of the churches they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand in the other church, they simply moved to a stronger blend. Members left the church in the latter example, and Rainier suggests maybe they started a new jerk church, the Right Blend Fellowship. <laughs> and, of course, there's always an argument whether you should allow deviled eggs at a church potluck. You have to balance that out with angel food cake, obviously, or you're going to have another problem. Well, um, and... Uh, there's just argument after argument. Churches have split over the color of the carpet, everything else, where the, where the organ should be, what piano bench should be used. It's nuts. And after I graduated from seminary, I attended a church that was cutting edge. It uh, had an hour of teaching with overheads and Greek verbs diagrammed and parsed. And, and then after that hour of teaching, everybody had 20 minutes for coffee. And then he came back in for another 45 minutes to an hour of uh, fellowship and prayer and uh, sharing what was going on in our lives. And, but one Sunday, three elders uh, sat on one side of the chancel and three elders on the other side. And they argued over whose name was on the mortgage because the senior pastor who had founded the church had been to Fuller Seminary that summer. And the word at Fuller Seminary School of Missiology and Church Growth was build up, not out. They had always planted churches when they had 200 or more from a neighborhood and they had about five churches in the area. But because uh, Peter Wagner, the big gun in that day, said, no, go mega, the senior pastor wanted to go mega, they had $90,000 in a fund uh, for future building, and they argued who owned that and who had that and whose name was on the mortgage. In fact, I remember they were taping each other secretly in meetings to have stuff against each other. These were seminary professors, most of them, a number of them. And I liked them. I had them as my professors. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. I hate to say it, but they weren't filled with the Spirit of God. They were filled with some other kind of spirit. I don't know. It really hurt the church, and the founding pastor took 400 people with him and left 100 at the home church, and I was eventually ordained by that church. 
But uh, they struggled ever since. And in fact, I've heard that they're, they've since closed. Um, you know, we're looking tonight at a brother who stirs up conflict in the community, or as the Amplified Bible says much clearer, and one who spreads discord, rumors among brothers. The question is, what causes people to stir up discord among brothers? Clearly, those who cause division need control, importance, significance, to feel powerful for sure. Sometimes they're simply mean people who were abused growing up and have not worked through their, have not worked through their pain or grieved their pain. My partner in private practice, Dr. Jim Rockwood, put it up a sign in our office that said, hurt people hurt people. And they do. If they haven't examined their pain, grieved it, and let it go as best they can. Also, some folks were raised in highly conflicted homes, so they think a normal attachment is through anger, not through love, nurture, compassion, care. A peaceful environment where people attach that way is just so weird that they, they can't trust it. They just can't trust it. And so they, maybe not purposefully, maybe unconsciously, they got to see if this new normal is a reality. They got to poke at the pastor and the church leadership and see if they're really who they say they are because they don't trust that an environment could be peaceful, calm, loving, and kind. And last but not least, some people who cause division and strife aren't comfortable when things are going well. Many of pastors have been let go when the church was getting along, growing, and going in a positive direction. Some members of churches can't stand it when the church is going well without them being in charge or directing things. I've personally experienced that one. But anyhow, we'll move right on. There, there are some of the psychological reasons I've seen in over 40 years of ministry, either as a counselor or a pastor. Biblically, we can boil down the reasons for people stirring up dissensions and divisions in the church to what Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul explains why people spread rumors, gossip, and hurt the fellowship. He explains for us that the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, notice in verse 20 that fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions are caused by individuals walking in the power of the flesh and not the power of the Holy Spirit. One source for this, the flesh. Paul says the acts of the flesh are obvious. I would say not to those who are walking in the flesh or according to their own power or ability. Bullies in the church think that their behavior is justified. They're much like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable in Luke 18, who said, thank God I'm not like all those other sinners, particularly the tax collector who was right there. No, they're self-righteous. And if we are self-righteous, then we're walking according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. And what I mean by that is we're walking in the power of our own strength, ability, knowledge, not in the power of the Spirit of God who indwells believers. We see this in the Corinthian church where Paul writes to them in his first epistle, chapters 3, 1 through 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere infants? Humans. The Christian life is a supernatural life. We can't do it. I think you all know that. Our good Lutheran theology tells us that. We are not, don't have the ability to keep the commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't have it. Only through the power of God, the Spirit who indwells us, can we do that. If we're not living by the Spirit, then we're living, they were living by the flesh. And this is what leads to divisions and factions in churches in the body of Christ. Now, Scripture shows us that there are two ways divisions and factions occur. One is doctrinally driven, and the second is personality driven. We don't have to look far from the acts or works of the flesh mentioned in Galatians 5. All we need to do is go back in his epistle to chapter 3 and chapter 1. 
He rebukes the Galatians for succumbing to the false teaching of the Judaizers who said that the Galatians were saved not only by faith in Christ alone, but by their keeping of the Jewish law, right? And so Paul rebukes them in chapter 3 for succumbing to the false teaching of the Judaizers. And in chapter 1, verse 6, he tells them, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He said, are you so foolish? In chapter 3, verse 3, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So saved by grace, but then sanctified by law, by their works, by what they did. They had to keep the law or they weren't saved or sanctified. Paul had to rebuke the churches in Galatia for their compromising the gospel with the Judaizers' message of grace plus works. Doctrinal drift is always a way by which factions and divisions develop. And when I served as a church, uh, served at a church in California, a so-called prophet at one of the mega churches said that we no longer should be saying the confession as part of the service because our sins have been forgiven for all eternity. Well, let me just tell you, the confession's, confession's been part of the divine service from the beginning of liturgy. We've always confessed our sins. Why? Jesus tells us to. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But why do we need to do that? Our, our vertical relationship may be fine with God, but if our horizontal relationship isn't good with uh, each other, then our vertical's affected as well. So we have to ask for forgiveness continually. Yes, we were forgiven once for all when we were baptized and believed in Christ as our Savior, but we also have a daily relationship with the Lord whereby we mess things up. We're saints and sinners. And John tells the believers in, in uh, his first epistle that if we confess our sins, he, the Lord Jesus, is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, and it's in present tense, to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. This is normal. This is daily. What did Martin Luther say? Repent daily. Admit you're a sinner. Confess your sins to the Lord. We just did that here. And it always helps me and always should help all of us. But that was part of the uh, heresy in a sense brought in there. You don't have to confess your sins. You're fine. Well, that's what the Gnostics said in the first century. Sin is is not what I do. My body does that. I don't have to confess it. In fact, I don't even have sin is what the Gnostics said. And John said, if we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us, but we say in the confession as well. So the second way dissensions occur is personality driven. In Acts 20, Paul warned the Ephesian elders with tears that wolves would spring up from within their ranks and attempt to draw people away from Jesus to themselves. He confronted the Corinthian believers because there were divisions in the church. Some followed Paul, some Apollos, some Cephas, and some Jesus, all proclaiming they were following the right person with pride and arrogance. Paul t told them their behavior evidenced carnality, not spirituality. They were walking according to the flesh and not to the spirit. The Apostle John had to address this in the church he planted in his third epistle. He tells his dear friend Gaius, a leader named Diotrephes, he says, uh, who loves to be first will have nothing to do with us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Notice John said, Diotrephes, or Di I'm not sure how to say it, Diotrephes loves to be first. This is another way to say selfish ambition, which Paul mentioned in Galatians 5 in the Acts of the Flesh. John didn't have a doctrinal dispute with Diotrephes. It was more about his conduct. Commentators suggest he's a person who doesn't want to recognize John's authority in this church. He's attempting to usurp that authority and be number one, so to speak, for the people of this church. So divisions and dissensions within the church are works of the flesh for sure. What then is the cure for acting out of our fleshly nature instead of letting the Holy Spirit live through us? Remember the first beatitude. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brokenness, like the tax collector evidenced in Luke 18, is the key to not living according to the flesh. We have to remember our baptisms, that we were raised to walk in newness of life. We do this by realizing we cannot keep the commandments or be like Jesus in all that we think, say, and do. Paul got to this spot in Romans 7, where he realized he was the most miserable of men because he was spiritually bankrupt. That what he wanted to do, he didn't do. That what he did, he didn't want to do. And his only victory was in Christ and the freedom from condemnation he had in Christ. So if we too know that our salvation and our sanctification, becoming like Christ, is all because of Christ and God's grace and only by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit can we live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. Only then will his purposes for the church will we be in agreement with and do everything we can to further the kingdom through the church. When we realize how much we need the Lord and his spirit, then we yield to his purposes and don't have to assert ours in the church. Paul tells us God's purpose for the church in Ephesians 4. He said he gave apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists uh, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. His purpose for the church will be greater than ours and we'll do whatever we can to further those purposes by using the gifts, talents, abilities that he's given us to be used for his glory if we're walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh. The final description, uh, one who stirs up dissension among brothers uh, is, a tr is general. It kind of sums up the other six. Dissension is attributed in Proverbs to contentious, quarreling people who have a short fuse. Paul, on the other hand, warns against envy, malice, and strife in 1 Timothy. These things then God will not tolerate. If he hates these things, then conversely he must love and desire humility, truthful speech, preservation of life, pure thoughts, the eagerness to do good things, honest witnesses, and peaceful harmony. Psalm 133.1 reads, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. May his purposes be greater than ours, and may we do everything we can so we here at OSLC live together in unity so God may be glorified and his name be praised. Francis Chan was asked by a church member, or a church manager complained to him, that they didn't get out of worship, much out of worship, one Sunday. Chan looked at that member and replied, that's because it's not about you. And all God's people said. Let's all stand and sing our hymn of response, The Goodness of God. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake To lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing a 
and minds for the Lord's Supper. Join with me in consecrating this holy meal. For the last time we gathered, we remembered when. <clears throat> On the night of His betrayal, our Lord took bread. He broke it as He blessed it, and then He said, my body given for you is what this means. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. And then he took the chalice and raised it high. My blood is given for you, a full supply, a covenant a promise, a cleansing stream. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. We share this meal together, remembering Christ. We share a common treasure and know the price. We share it without measure, a gift of love. We share our lives forever with God above. If your family hold hands, if not, just give a virtual hand hold to the person next to you as we pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. I mean, all are welcome at the table as is the Lord's table. Come now and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Come now, the Father's arms are open wide.
The blood of Christ shed for the remission of your sins. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God Creator bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the Spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Thanks for working with us this evening. Appreciate you all. If you have any problems, questions, anything, call the office. Call me at home or on my cell. Never a burden. Always a blessing to chat with you. Hope you have a great rest of the week. And hope to see you Sunday at 9. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.